Okay, so we'll get, we'll get started. Um, so this week's lecture, we're shifting gears to look at management accounting. So I've got a picture of a, of a car behind me. I'm inside of a factory. Uh, so this lecture is entirely from the view of a manufacturer. So management accounting can be done for retail firms and service firms as well. But in 1B, we're just giving you a taster of management accounting. So just taking one point of view that we're a manufacturer, we're manufacturing something in our factory. And next week's lecture, we're gonna have the first one hour is talking about the future of accounting. I'm gonna have a panel of guests uh, and then be able to ask questions of, of those guests. They're gonna talk about where they think the future of accounting is going in the next five to 10 years. And then the second hour of that lecture talk about the final exam. So just one more lecture next week. This is the last of the, of the topics that's examinable as well. So next week's topic is not on the final exam. So it's more just an information session if you're interested in becoming an accountant. And also then the last one hour will be about the final exam. So the uh, readings for this week are some online chapters. So if you uh, got a card, special card with your textbook, you can use the code on that to access these electronic chapters. Uh, otherwise you could purchase them separately. They do have some really good illustrative examples that you can work along with. So there's two parts to this lecture. The first part is about costing. The aim of the costing section is to stick all of the costs onto our product, our cost object, as it moves through the factory. The second half of this lecture will be about budgeting. So looking to make a forward plan for our business as, as you know, like where are we going? How many units are we going to produce? That's also from the perspective of a manufacturer. My mouse is my mouse is not behaving itself tonight. I don't know. If, I think the battery is getting low. Okay, so we're interested in costing, determining the cost of a product. Uh, we're going to use predetermined overhead rate. I'm going to introduce you to this new system called normal costing which allows us to have even more timely information and determine cost earlier than using actual costing. We're going to also like apply overheads to our product uh, and incorporate it into work in process using this normal costing system. I'm gonna show you how to calculate if there is some variance of over or under applied overhead uh, we're going to compare job costing versus process costing. They're two different costing systems. The choice is really based on what's happening inside of our factory, what sort of um, product is being made, how is it being made. Uh, we're going to look at the journal entries to record job order costing, and then looking at understanding the limitations of, of product costing as well. So we're shifting gears. We're looking at management accounting. Uh, it's quite different compared to the previous weeks of this course, which looked at financial accounting. So management accounting is about providing information for managers to make decisions. So it's internal to the company. We're interested in that, you know, the decisions a manager wants to make and often customizing reports for a manager. Whereas the financial accounting was, we were preparing uh, statements like the income statement, balance sheet and cash flow statement for external users to uh, look at, make decisions such as investors, creditors and lenders. Because those financial statements are used by external parties, there's accounting standards which guide what goes on to those uh, statements. There's rules which protect those external users. Uh, so you saw in, so like the majority of this course that we've covered already, the accounting standards are the rules that guide 
what can be recorded. So what can be an asset, what can't be an asset, what can be a liability, what can't be a liability, all those kinds of rules. Management accounting has no rules. It's what the manager wants. So we're trying to support the decision-making of managers. So what we're going to do is prepare some reports uh, in, in, management, in our management accounting topic here for 1B, we're going to be preparing some generalised reports, which might be more customised given what a manager in a particular factory would like to see. So part one of this lecture is about costing. Uh, the cost determines the sales price. So that's what we have for manufacturers. They're interested to get their costs plus some sort of return to markup. The second half of this lecture is about the decision making, the budgeting, uh, planning, control, and evaluation. But the important thing is management accounting is quite different from financial accounting because we're preparing the information for decisions of managers, so insiders to the company. So we are picking up back up from uh, where you left off in 1A, except we don't backtrack over CVP analysis. And I'm going to be showing you a new costing system. So we're, I'm going to just refresh your mind about what you did in 1A. So this first bit, we're looking at the cost of goods manufactured. So this statement, we're interested in calculating, uh, so how much of the goods that we have there the three components, direct materials, direct layer and overhead, but how much is finished? How much of our products is finished for the period? And so we take what we've manufactured of those costs, add the opening work in process, what's on hand, and minus what is left at the end, partially complete. And this gives us the cost of goods manufactured. They're gonna be transferred to finished goods. So we are gonna be looking back at this statement but using a new costing method called normal costing. Then we're also interested in the cost of goods sold. So we're interested, okay, for this period of the goods that were finished, how many were sold? So we do that calculation of plus the opening finished goods, the ones that are on hand, minus those that are left at the end. That will give us cost of goods sold. I'm going to to send you a question now, see what you think. So are selling costs, uh, for example, the sales commission included in cost of goods sold? What do you think? Okay, so we've got two saying yes, 10 saying no. The answer is no, because this, the selling costs are not directly related to building or you know, developing that product. They're just add-ons. So things like a sales commission just incentivizes the shop assistant to sell a product. It's not to do with actually making the product. So we're interested in the cost to make the product, which should then go into our cost of goods sold. And you can tell if when you go into a shop, if an employee in the shop is paid on a sales commission because they're very keen to help you because they're personally going to get like a bonus for selling you a product. Okay, so we're going to go through some, uh, some terms to help us in our costing. So the first is that there's a cost, so that's an outflow of our resources, something that's been ex ex expensed. Then the idea is that we want to stick all of those costs to the cost object as it goes through our factory. 
So we, and in, in, our, in 1B world, we just look at manufacturers. So we want to make sure all the costs are stuck to the product as it goes through the factory. So that at the end, when we do record a cost of goods sold, it's the, all of the costs have been stuck on it to then match with the revenue. So we're essentially capitalizing as the product is being built, sticking the costs to that cost object. A cost object can also be a service or it could be a subunit of a, of a, of a larger company. But in 1B, we just focus on a product that's being manufactured. So the cost driver, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a particular, um, you know, way of putting some of those costs onto the cost object. Because we need to be thinking about to select the appropriate cost driver, what kind of activity is happening inside of our factory. So we're going to be wanting to uh, stick some of those costs that might be what we call indirect, like electricity or factory rent onto our products. So we need to look inside of our factory and see are there humans or are there robots? How are we going to um, appropriately measure the activity going on in the factory? So in 1B, we're only going to have two different uh, drivers. We're going to have either uh, direct labor hours or machine hours. In the real world, there's hundreds of different activity drivers. So now we're interested in some uh, different cost classifications. Uh, in 1, 1A, you would have looked at fixed, mixed and variable. We're not backtracking over that. We're more interested in, in this left-hand side classification. We're interested in whether a cost is classified as being manufacturing or non-manufacturing. A simple way to think about this is whether a cost takes place inside of the factory or in a support office. This is the typical kind of breakdown of our costs for our, for our manufacturer. So in manufacturing, it's directly, it's related to the product. It happens in the factory versus non-manufacturing could be the support office, administrative staff, could be CEO salary. That's all not directly in the factory related to building that product. So where do those non-manufacturing uh, costs go? So we have things like selling an admin, they're gonna be reported in the income statement. So we don't need to stick those to our cost object. So that, and they're essentially they're optional extras. Um, our manufacturing, think about it as being inside of our factory. Then we want to further split into direct and indirect which I'm going to talk about more in, in a little bit later in this lecture. And then here are our three core costs to our product. So direct materials, direct labor and overhead. So these are all essential to manufacturing our product and they're going to be appearing in the cost of goods manufacture statement and the cost of goods sold statement. So let's explore this a little bit further the direct versus indirect costs. So direct costs, they can be traced to the cost object, for example, the product, and it is economically feasible. Whereas indirect costs, they cannot be traced and it's because it's not economically feasible. So this is to do with the cost of doing that particular tracing. Because in accounting, we make a cost versus benefits trade-off. So we're trying to think about, okay, if the cost of doing something outweighs the benefit, it's not really worth doing. So let's have a think about making uh, manufacturing sofas. So if you have sofas and they have some glue and nails in them, we could, in theory, count the number of nails and measure in a measuring cup the amount of glue. However, the cost of doing that it's just not worth it. It's going to be far too expensive compared to any benefit we would get from accurately measuring the glue and nails. What we would do instead is say that 
the glue in nails is indirect and just spread that cost. Let's say it's $500 for that month. We just spread it over all of the sofas in the factory. So you could, in theory, sit down and count the nails and measure the glue, but it might cost you $100 to do it, but the benefit is not, it's much less than $100. So we do that trade-off. So think about it that way. Not that it's impossible to measure, it's just that it is too costly. Or, you know, think about like the, the factory supervisor. Let's say in the factory I've got behind me with, I've got Mercedes Benz cars. What if there's a supervisor who wanders around the factory and we then stop them and went, oh, how much did you look at that car or that car? They wouldn't be able to tell you. They're supervising the whole factory. So we spread the supervisor's salary over all of the products, over all the cars that are being manufactured. So in terms of cost assignment, this is about how do we get those costs, direct and indirect, to stick to the cost object, to our product. Um, direct, direct costs are traced to the cost object. Often there's a job cost sheet and everything gets recorded, all the direct materials, all the direct labor, they, that all gets recorded. Versus indirect costs are allocated. So we're gonna use estimates to get things like the glue and nails, the factory supervisor salary onto those products. So the measurement, it could be dollar amounts, uh, direct materials, direct labor and overhead, and can be actual or estimates. So here we've got this, once again, this classification, manufacturing, non-manufacturing, and so non-manufacturing, we can also use the label period costs. They just so happen in the period in which they, they are incurred. So things like the commercial distribution admin, they can be fixed or variable. Then we have our, for our manufacturing, we have our product costs. These are then attached uh, to the units that are produced. And then they, and they essentially capitalize until they're sold and at that time they're expensed. So then we have two classifications here of our manufacturing costs. We can have prime costs, so they're the core to manufacturing the product, direct materials and direct labor. Then on the other hand, we have a classification known as conversion costs, which are the costs associated with converting the raw materials into a finished product. So these include the direct labor and the overhead. And these can be also be fixed versus variable. So fixed regardless of production level versus variable costs that vary with production level. So I'm gonna walk you through a few examples and feel free at any time, ask me questions in the chat box if any of this doesn't make any sense. Okay. So the wood being built in a new house, it's going to be a direct cost. It is traceable to the product. Just imagine that there's, there's big um, like wall panels of timber. They're already all stuck together. They can measure exactly how many of those timber panels are needed and they can just pop them all in. And each of those houses is identifiable. So we can go, there's five panels that are going to house number 10 and we can record that. The salary of the warehouse clerk, this is, it's inside of the factory, but it's gonna be indirect. So just imagine I'm sitting, I'm sitting in the factory here. What if I'm sitting behind the warehouse uh, desk? I'd be handing over things like steering wheels or wheels for the cars. And so if you ask someone who's the warehouse clerk, how much time did you spend on car number one, two, three? They don't know, they're just issuing materials out for those cars to be made. So then we just spread their salary over all of the cars. So all of them that are manufactured. So it's hard for them to say, it's not feasible to trace it. So printing and postage of advertising flyers, this is gonna be a period cost, it's an optional add-in. It's not essential to manufacturing our product, 
it's something we, the company decides to do later on. It's non-manufacturing, it's outside the factory. So the fees paid for annual audit, that's non-manufacturing as well. It's not essential to the product being built. And so it's gonna be just incurred in the period and it's a non-manufacturing cost. So glue nails in the sofa, I've used this example already. So it's, it's inside the factory, uh, but it's not um, economically feasible to trace it. It might cost $100, $200 to do it, and there's no particular benefit. So they just take, let's say, $500 cost of glue and nails for the period, and they'll just spread it over all of the sofas manufactured. So wages of production workers. This is going to be direct. Now, think about the wage of production workers in a different way to office workers. So production workers, they will clock on and clock off to specific jobs. So let's say in my factory behind me, they clock on to particular cars and then say, okay, 9 a.m. I start, work for two hours, clock off, go and have lunch or whatever, then come back, work another three hours, and they record it on, on the job cost sheet so that we know how much labor has been expended. So it's very controlled, recorded. Whereas an office worker, they will just, just do some brain work. They might not record necessarily their labor. They might go, la, 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 five o'clock, time to go home. So think about production line workers, very much they're recording their labor. And we have it, we've captured it. Some, uh, some factories even have like a swipe card system they swipe in and it's recorded. All of their labor is recorded. So think about it in that way. It's very different to office workers. So why is cost so important for manufacturers? It's because cost determines selling price. So manufacturers want to make back the cost plus some sort of markup. So cost is, is really important and the earlier manufacturer can determine cost, the earlier they can then determine a selling price. So here we've got an example of a cost of $40, then they want to do a markup of 60%, so they've one plus 60%. So the selling price that communicates to their customers would be $64. So in the, in the real world, uh, some products have very high amount of markup so for example, uh, women's clothes and women's handbags can sometimes have a thousand percent markup or, you know, 4,000 percent markup because the cost is not that high, but the selling price is very high. So manufacturers are looking to make not only their cost back of their product, but also a markup. That markup then becomes part of their profits. So there's uh, three different ways of measuring our costs. So three different systems. In 1A, you would have been introduced to actual costing where everything, direct materials, direct labor and overhead are recorded at actual. Now in 1B, I'm going to introduce you to a more timely method of costing known as normal costing. It's a hybrid system. So it contains some actuals and some estimates. If you were to go on and do second year and third year management accounting topics, you'd be, interested, you'd, you'd be introduced to this budgeted costing where everything is done at a predetermined rate. This is also known as standard costing. So everything is estimated in advance, direct materials, direct labor and overhead, and then reconciled with actual at the end of the period. But we're going to just go in the middle and we're going to have direct materials and direct labor at actual, then we're going to have our overhead at a predetermined rate. That gives us a more timely amount of cost that can be determined because we don't have to wait for things like the electricity bill, which could be billed on a quarterly basis. We might have to wait three months to find that out, or it could be you know, the, like things like the glue and nails, we don't measure how much was used until much later on. 
So normal costing gives us an advantage over actual costing of more timely cost information. And the sooner a manufacturer can determine the cost, the sooner it can, com it can communicate that to its customers. And that's what the majority of manufacturers will do. They'll do that cost plus markup strategy, then they can get to market really early, tell their customers, this is the cost of the product. There is a requirement that we then adjust at year end uh, in case if there's been any over or under amount of uh, estimate that we have for our overhead. So there's a bit of a trade off there. We sacrifice some reliability for more relevant, more timely information. So here we're looking at how do we get the costs onto our cost object. In this case, we're a manufacturer, it's our product. So our direct materials, direct labor, our direct costs, they're traced to that cost object. As I was saying before, we'd have a job order cost sheet where every time some raw materials is taken out of the storeroom and put into the product, so let's say a steering wheel, an engine gets recorded. Every time some labor is used, it gets recorded. Two hours of labor, three hours of labor. The indirect costs have to be allocated. So for example, our glue and nails has to be allocated to each of the products in our factory. So we're going to do that uh, based on an overhead rate and we, we sacrifice that reliability for the timeliness. We accept the fact we might have some variance. So how do we assign the costs? Uh, there's two different uh, costing systems that we can use and we're going to try and match the type of product that we're making in our factory to one of these two different costing systems. So on the one hand, we've got the job order costing system where we have identifiable uh, products or services. We can point to them, we can go, okay, we can see those. So I've got a little picture here. Oops, let's go back. So let's say we're inside of Boeing's uh, factory. So Boeing would be able to say to us, okay, so this plane here is uh, for Singapore Airlines, this plane here is for Qantas, and this plane here is for Emirates. They'd be able to identify them. And they say, they might say that's plane number 154, 753, you know, so they know those planes. They're identifiable. Plan these, these large Planes for airlines are often customized. They want to have particular style. They want to have particular seat configuration. So it's identifiable. So each of those planes would have a job cost sheet. Everything's recorded in terms of what is taken out of storeroom and put onto those planes. On the other end of the spectrum is process costing. It's for an indistinguishable flow of identical products. So they're all kind of flowing through our factory. We can't say that one part is different from another. I've got an example there, a picture of crude oil. So oil just kind of goes through the processing and we can't distinguish it. Another example is orange juice. So the orange juice kind of flows through the factory. We can't identify any particular bit. So I'm gonna send you a poll uh, to see how would you classify these particular products. Uh, so which, which job, which costing system? So let's have a look. So this is job costing system. Which of the following products would be best suited to job costing system? So orange juice, uh, C200 Mercedes cars, only one type of car made in the factory, jet fighter planes, custom ordered, crude oil or natural gas. So have a go, which one suited to the job costing?
we're, we're pretty evenly split. We've got six saying the C200 Mercedes car. We've got six saying the jet fighter planes custom ordered. So the answer is the jet fighter planes because they're all identifiable, they're distinguishable. Whereas if we did have a factory that made all C200 identical Mercedes cars, they would be um, more suited to process costing. They're just, uh, just indistinguishable flow through our factory. So I'll just send you another poll. So have a look, which of the following would be best suited to um, our process costing? Would it be robot carpet cleaners, all identical, 1000s made, uh, luxury boats, custom design, airplanes created for airlines, Louis Vuitton factory where 10 styles of handbags are made in limited edition volumes or Ferrari cars with custom interiors, low volume, using Gucci and Hermes style for interiors. So what, what do you think is best suited to process costing? Oh, Kuntum has a question where we have, to, we have questions in exam where we have to write a paragraph. It's possible there's some writing in this course. It's not just a calculation course. So it's possible we have to write something. Yes. Yeah, Marshall. Yeah, there could be short answer questions. We never get you to write an essay. Accounting is not really an essay type of course but we might ask you to write one or two sentences because you can see some of our questions. Sometimes we have a box. Yeah. Okay. So we've got 10 saying the robot carpet cleaners, one saying the Louis Vuitton bags. It's the robots. That's the answer because they're all identical. They're all indistinguishable. Whereas all of the others in my example, they're all custom or distinguishable. Okay. So normal costing, um, we want to uh, directly trace uh, direct materials and direct labor onto each of the jobs. So job number one, number two, number three, uh, all of it is recorded at actual. And as I said before, we would likely have a job cost sheet to record that. And sometimes companies, manufacturers might have T accounts for each of those uh, particular jobs. So, so 30% of the leather was used to produce a Lewis bag versus the rest for a Chanel bag. So we're recording for each of our products onto those particular jobs. Then our overhead, we want to apply it to the jobs. We would apply it using an overhead, a predetermined overhead rate, and we would allocate it based on some sort of driver. So the cost driver is about looking inside the factory and trying to work out, okay, is it direct labor hours or machine hours that is responsible for making those products? Because that tells us how much cost is going to be used for each product. So we need to maybe allocate things like depreciation, factory rent, factory supervisor salary to each of those jobs. So process costing, what's much more important for things like our orange juice is the, the, the departments that it goes through. We might add some raw materials at different stages. So let's say we're making orange juice, we might start off by adding the oranges into department one, but department two might have to add some sugar. That could be our blending department to balance out the orange juice. And then department three, we might add the plastic bottles which we then fill up with the orange juice. It then gets, uh, the orange juice is then 
uh, sent out at the end, it's finished once it's in the plastic bottles. Direct labour might be recorded in each department. Each employee records how much they work and the overhead gets spread to each of those departments. So here's some journal entries that you might see to help us to record the costs in our process costing. The first of those journal entries is to do with transferring, let's say the, the crushed oranges uh, and the orange juice from department one to department two. Then we, in department two, we might add some sugar. That journal entry is about recording that sugar being added. Then we might transfer from department two to department three in our next journal entry. So we're much more interested in those processes in our process costing, what, what happens to them. And sometimes we might have some partially completed inventories, which we still need to cost. They still have a value, even if they're only partially complete. So we work, want to work out something that calculation is known as equivalent units. So it could be, let's say if we're making robot dogs, we might say that, okay, we've got three lots of the robot dogs that are half complete, we might have five lots of the robot dogs in department B that are half complete as well. We work out some sort of equivalency to fully completed units. And then we can say, well, these partially completed products are equivalent to four fully complete units. This is just so we can put a cost on them and maybe put them, we put them into our ending work in process category. So, because at the end of the period, we might stop the factory or might have some partially completed products. We still need to record some sort of cost to, to capitalize those and record it as inventory. So our predetermined overhead rate, this is all about trying to get our overhead costs onto our product. Because we're using normal costing, we use expected or budgeted costs. So for example, we have 45,500 is our overhead cost we, that we've uh, expected, so budgeted, and we budgeted 50 machine hours. So we divide those overhead costs by our budgeted hours to get our overhead, our predetermined overhead rate, $910 per machine hour. Machine hours in this case is then our cost driver. And so it must be that this factory uses a majority of machines to manufacture the product, we then will multiply that overhead driver by the actual number of hours for each of our products. In the real world, there's heaps of hundreds and hundreds of different cost drivers. It's all about what's happening inside our factory. So when we look inside the factory, is it humans that are making the product? So then it's direct labor hours. But if it's machines in our factory, it's direct labor hours. And we only use two cost drivers in 1B. This is just introductory accounting. But in the real world, you encounter hundreds of different cost drivers and they're chosen to match that particular factory and what's going on. So this is sort of summarizing what I've been talking about. So uh, direct materials, direct labor at actual uh, overhead in 1B, we only have two activity drivers, direct labor or machine, direct machine hours. And we always tell you in our 1B questions as well. We don't, we don't make you have to choose either. So let's say, um, what if we had a t-shirt factory? What would be our cost driver? So I will send you a question. Let's have a look. What do we think? So let's think of a t-shirt factory. What would be the cost driver? You look inside the factory and there's a vast amount of robots and machinery making the t-shirts and only three humans supervising and doing repairs. So what do you think? Is it direct labor hours or direct machine hours or not sure?
Okay. So we've got 10 saying the direct machine hours, we've got one saying direct labor hours. It's the direct machine hours, because if we're seeing in the factory, the majority of the work being done by machines, the machine hours is the best approximation of the activity in the factory and how much overhead each of those products should get. Okay. So the cost flow, we're interested, okay, we want to stick all of our costs to our cost object as it moves through the factory. So we want to capitalize. And so we're going to debit work in process for each of these costs. And we're going to then, so record our raw materials that are added to our product, direct labor and our overhead. So we substitute in our, our work in process as our, as our debit part to capitalize. And we don't cost or expense our product until the end when it hits cost of goods sold. The credit part is to our raw materials account or our wages payable. So overhead account, it's an unusual account. It's essentially an expense account, but it has in our normal costing system, a function of reconciling our applied overhead with our actual overhead. So we pop into our credit side, the applied overhead early in the period when we're able to estimate our overhead cost and multiply it by our actual activity. And then later on, let's say maybe a month later, when we get the electricity bill, we find out the factory supervisor's salary, we record them all in on the debit side. Our aim is at the end of the period for this account to be equal to zero. So if there's any under or over applied overhead, we need to clear it out of this account. So think about it as a temporary account that needs to have a zero balance at the end of each period. So in our example, earlier we calculated that 910 predetermined overhead rate. We can now multiply it by 35 direct, direct machine hours. That applies our overhead of 31,850 in on the credit side of our overhead account. So then we capitalizing that overhead cost by debiting work in process, crediting overhead control. Later on, we'll come and record the actual overheads in on the debit side and then try and reconcile with our applied overhead. So uh, there's a workshop question that it's in this lecture slides and it's in the handout as well. There's also, I've made a full length video about that workshop question, which is on the middle side too. If, so you can have a look at that video as well. So in terms of our example, they made these hot dogs, which are robot dogs. They're going to uh, use job order costing though, because they've got two identifiable jobs, job number one, job number two. They tell us how much the selling price is. It's determined as, as cost plus 60% markup. They tell us there were some raw materials purchased during the period. They tell us how much raw materials is used for job number one and job number two. And tell us the direct labor costs that's incurred, the hours, and the dollar amount. They then tell us about uh, their overhead that they use machine hours as their activity driver, and they have the budgeted overhead that's expected 45,500. They tell us actual hours, machine hours of our activity driver that job number one and two have used. Then, you know, so we've, we're able to calculate, we calculated earlier the predetermined overhead rate, which we got $910, which we can then apply to those actual hours. So then we can also, let's, we can add up our raw materials for the period, direct materials. And we add those two amounts up. We can add up to get our direct labor costs based on these cal calculations here. And we're going to capitalize each of these costs into our work in process. Uh, then we don't cost, we don't expense it until those inventories are sold. So our first journal entry here, we're going to record our raw materials purchase on credit. So that journal entry is pretty straightforward because uh, it's on because it's on credit. We, the credit accounts payable. So the next journal entry, we're recording the use of raw materials. 
for job number one and job number two. So think about this, we're pulling um, raw materials from, from the storeroom of the factory and we're starting to incorporate it into the product. So we're capitalizing, we're building some inventories and they're going to work in process inventory. So it's capitalizing those raw materials costs. So debit work in process credit raw materials for the sum of the, all of the materials, job one and job two. Then our direct labor to our employees are transforming those raw materials into a finished product. So we need to capitalize those costs as well. So debit work in process credit wages payable because we won't pay those wages until uh, payday. So for the next period, so we credit that wages payable there. So in terms of our overhead, we've got our actual hours and we multiply those by the predetermined overhead rate of $910. And we capitalize our overhead at our applied amount, debit working process, credit overhead control, because we want to apply the overhead under normal costing. So we can do this even earlier than if we had to wait for actual overheads. So our overhead account, we can put in our applied overhead on the credit side. And then we will now later on, maybe one or two months later, record our actual overhead. So we need to be reconciling our actual with applied overhead. So we're going to debit our overhead control and credit then uh, all of the, the uh, payables that match together and also accumulated depreciation that matches with our, our, our particular items in terms of our indirect costs. So the factory rent, rent payable, factory electricity, electricity payable, uh, the factory equipment, credit accumulated appreciation. And so wages payable here for some indirect labor, maybe our factory supervisor salary. So do we need to include the selling general and admin SGNA uh, when calculating the cost of goods manufactured? No, they're not including our cost of goods sold. They're optional add-ons. They're gonna go straight to the income statement. So here now we can reconcile our actual on the debit side with our applied overhead on the credit side. We want this account to be equal to zero. So we work out has it been under or over applied and how much we applied was greater than actual. So we need to uh, record that we have over applied by 905. So there's the two different options is that Either it's going to actual is greater than applied, so under applied, not enough, or applied greater than actual, so over applied. The treatment can be material or immaterial. If it's material, it means it's very big. We, we need to treat uh, three accounts, work in process, finished goods and cost of goods sold. If it's immaterial, it seems to be a very small amount. So we're only going to do a treatment just the cost of goods sold. So here, this is how we explain why in the material approach, we have to transform and adjust our work and process, finish goods and cost of goods sold. So we need to uh, do this because our applied overhead went into work and process, then into finished goods, and then into cost of goods sold. So this, uh, the fact that it's in all three accounts if we believe it's very serious, it's a large amount, it's material, then we would need to uh, transform each of those three key accounts. So, but if it's immaterial, we just send it to cost of goods sold. In this particular question, we do think it's immaterial. So we just debit overhead control and that's to remove. So we had to do a debit to top it up Well and in comparison to what are applied versus our actual, which then in turn reduces our cost of goods sold. So credit cost of goods sold over applied, we applied too much. So we're going to reduce that. Let's imagine, for example, a, a, let's imagine a different example 
And let's say if it is material, we're going to, on a pro rata basis, uh, spread some of that under or over applied overhead to working process, finished goods and cost of goods sold, because all three of them have overhead applied included. So let's, ex let's, let's look at a different example. This is not the power pooch uh, robot dogs. This is just because it's nice round amounts. So what we would then do is get the ending balance of work in process, finished goods, cost of goods sold. So 5,000, 15,000, 30,000, add up the sum of the three balances, that becomes our denominator. So we're working out a pro rata or proportional distribution so it's in proportion to the ending balances, which we assume to be a good proxy for how much of our overhead is included in those accounts. So we then spread to the three accounts, let's say working process, we send 500, finished goods 1,500, and cost of goods sold 3,000. So we've spread all of that 5,000 variance to those three accounts. So that's the material treatment. So back, back coming back to the power pooch example. So we compare actual with overhead. So uh, sorry, actual with applied overhead. We had 905. Um, we assumed it's immaterial based on what the question tells us. So we're just going to debit our overhead control and credit cost of goods sold. So that's the treatment. We've disposed of that variance, whereas material would be to all three of those accounts. So then we're asked to provide a schedule of cost of goods manufactured and uh, finished goods is just going to be job number one because they told us job number one is finished. Job number two is not finished. It's going to stay behind in working process. So here we've got uh, the schedule of cost of goods manufactured. And so we put in, we started with zero raw materials. Then we purchased 11,000. We know we use 10,100. So we can reverse calculate it, the, the closing raw materials balance, 11,000 minus 10,100 gives us 900 that was left in our ending raw materials inventory. So then we put in, so direct materials use, direct labor, then we record it as our actual overheads because we find out this information later, but then we transform it to add in that over applied overhead because at the stage of the working process to account being calculated, we didn't know that. Why do we present it like this? Well, a manager would want to know. They'd want to know what, what the actual overheads are and what under or over applied amount there is. But then they sort of like transformed it so that then it's equal to work in process. And also uh, we don't adjust work in process account. So if we didn't have that uh, over applied overhead, this wouldn't calculate out. So our total manufacturing costs is, is based on that predetermined overhead rate. So then we continue on in our cost of goods manufactured. So we had that job number one is completed, job number two stays behind. So finished goods that's manufactured is job number one, work in process closing balance job number two. So we put those in, less job number two stays behind and job number one goes forward to finished goods. So that's our cost of finished goods manufactured. So here then we've got our cost of goods sold. So we put in what was finished, uh, less closing finished goods. So job number one is not only finished but also sold and job number one goes into cost of goods sold at this point, we now adjust for the over applied overhead in our cost of goods sold account. That gives us adjusted cost of goods sold. So here we've got cost of goods sold is based on actual overhead because of our adjustment. So our period costs, remember selling an admin goes straight to the income statement. So we can record these. So advertising, sales commission, office salaries, depreciation office equipment, we can just put them into two categories. So that income statement only has two lines. So selling expenses, advertising plus sales commissions. And then we've got our admin. 
is our other, other expenses. So then we pop them in and we put in sales at cost plus markup. We use unadjusted cost of goods sold. So we wanted to determine our selling price early as soon as possible. So we use that earlier normal costing amount of our unadjusted cost of goods sold to determine selling price. But then we put in cost of goods sold as adjusted because it's for external users. We want it to be actual information so we've adjusted it then. Then we put in our selling and admin costs. That gives us our net profit. So unadjusted uh, cost of goods sold used in our selling price to use that more timely information to give that information to our customers. So there's some limitations of product costing. So the volume measure, it needs to be a good approximation of what's happening inside the factory. So direct labor hours or machine hours. But in the real world, there's lots and lots of different allocation rates or we could use multiple allocation rates for the same factory. Something that uses lots of different rates is activity-based costing. Um, also, we can have something called target costing. So if you go into second year and third year management accounting, you learn more about these different costing methods. But uh, one B, we're just simple. We just use two different methods of allocation. Okay, so at this point, we're going to have a five minute break.
Okay, so we'll get started again. Are there any questions at this point? No? Okay, so we're going to continue on. We've got the second half of the lecture now. This is about budgeting. So I've got a little, <laughs> little cartoon here. So, so like Dilbert and his boss, his boss is like, uh, I need a budget estimate for your project. One billion dollars, and he goes. That doesn't sound reasonable. Uh, I'll shout numbers at you, and I'll stop when one sounds reasonable. Eleven, ten, nine. Please stop being you. <laughs> so hopefully the budgeting process is a bit better than than Dilbert's um, budgeting process. So we're interested in uh, looking at budgets. What are they? How are they used within organisations? Uh, also, that there's behavioural considerations. So there's often uh, things like bonuses that are based on our budgets. So we want to understand if we give employees incentives based on budgets, how would they react? Uh, you know, so we don't want any any unintended consequences, or to and then to be able to correct for that behaviour. Going to look at the master budget and the little budgets that go inside of it, look at how to complete those budgets. I'm going to introduce you to a static versus flexible budgets and how to interpret a flexible budget. So a budget is a plan for a whole company, uh, how they're going to achieve particular goals. It's a good way of communicating to a whole company so as soon as an entrepreneur goes from being more than just one person, so they get on a, another person in their company, they need to have a budget. They need to communicate. So it's okay when you're by yourself in a business, you can tell yourself, let's produce 10 products this week. But as soon as you get one other person, you have to communicate to them what the budget is. And large global corporations have to communicate with lots of different subunits across the around the whole world. So budgets can be presented in different terms. So it could be physical, so a number of units to sell, or it could be in dollars. So dollar amounts of maybe what's going to be purchased. It's a way of translating those goals and strategies into particular um, operational targets to, to get uh, that company going. So the budget, the budget forecasts, you know, they, they then can, they're able to be, um, you know, their forward prediction of the future based on these estimates of what they might expect for the company in terms of dollars or units. So the benefits of budgeting, and we can see from a lot of uh, research that we've done into companies, that successful companies have budgets. And so there's often a certain point at which a company, they start to use budgets as they're growing and then they can really take off versus companies that don't use budgets, they may not be able to grow. So budgets are a great way of doing the planning, setting targets and goals and communicating then those targets and goals to the whole of the company and so then it's they're able to coordinate across the whole company to say, this is what we want to do. We want to build 10,000 units uh, and you know, sell those 10,000 units to customers. So it enables us, those budgets can set up a way of benchmarking and controlling and managing that company appropriately. So they can then evaluate. So at the end of the period, what was the actual? They can compare budgeted with actual and then they could reward based on that or they could investigate if there's something that doesn't work out. Uh, you know, there's a big variance and they have to then they can find out and work out what's going wrong. So it's really good controlling benchmarking for an organization. So a master budget is the umbrella term for that comprehensive budget plan. It's made up of all different little tiny budgets within the master budget. It's got operating, cash, and financial uh, statement budgets included. 
And so the budget preparation is all about the first stage, the operating budgets, that much, that's how much the company plans to sell or to make. So make if they're a manufacturer. Uh, once again, we're taking a manufacturer's view. And so we're still inside of a factory. We're making a product. Um, if it's just selling, that's a retailer. You can do budgets for retailers and also for service firms, but they're outside the scope of 1B. We leave that to second year and third year management accounting courses. So there's cash budgets then as well. How much is receivable? How much is payable? Then we can uh, take all of that information from the operating and cash budget and prepare um, budgeted financial statements like an income statement and a balance sheet and a cash flow statement as well. So we've got in the blue box here all of our operating budgets. Then in the pinkish box here, we've got our cash budgets. The green box, we've got our financial statement budgets. So you can put across on the cash budgets, they're not examinable in 1B. Also put across on the financial statement budgets, they're not examinable in 1B. We just don't have enough time. So we're concentrating just on the blue part, our operating budgets. And we'll, I'll be showing you how to calculate these budgets. So, and that they have an interrelationship. The numbers are gonna flow one into the other. So our focus in 1B is on the operating budgets. And just in case you didn't catch that bit, I have a slide saying operating budgets are the only budgets that are examinable in 1B. So that's the only thing that could be on the final exam. Cash budget, financial statement budgets, no, not on the exam. If you do search around on the internet and you look at past exam papers, some of them do have cash budgets, financial statement budgets but they, they're from a different version of this course. So don't go trawling around on the internet looking at exams. You can get confused because what's inside the scope of 1B has changed a lot over time. So only look at the past exam papers that I've given you on the 1B Moodle side and also a number of our tutorial questions are past exam questions as well. So don't just don't, don't go out on the internet because there are cash budgets and if you post up on the discussion board, I'm going to say, no, that's a very old exam. It's no longer relevant. So the concepts are important for budgeting. Uh, so concepts about cash budget, financial statement budgets, but you're not required to be able to calculate those. So here we've got power pooch is our example as well. And if you want to see this in more detail, once again, I've got a video on the Moodle site that goes through this uh, lecture workshop question as well. So we're given some information in terms of these robot uh, dogs that they're manufacturing. So once again, we're a manufacturer, we're in a factory, we're building robot dogs, and we're told this is what they budget in terms of their sales for January, February, March, and April. They tell us the sales price they budget, 1,100. They told us that the finished goods inventory should be equal to the next sales, um, next months of sales required. So this means that they're very much concerned about the supply chain. They want to have all of the products prepared for next month uh, in a month in advance. So in your tutorial questions, this is going to be slightly different. It reflects the reality of the real world of maybe it's 10% of next period sales or 50% of next period sales. This example is a bit extreme. They want everything for the next month produced in advance. That means they're covered next month if let's say one of their suppliers, their factory burns down or there's an earthquake or a hurricane or you know, so COVID-19 has definitely interrupted the supply chain. I know of some manufacturing companies who've just had to stop production. They can't get the supplies that they need. So companies have a buffer They'll often have a buffer of, of both ending inventories and also of raw materials so they can continue to operate as a business. So then you've got some finished goods that are on hand at the beginning. So no raw materials, no work in process at the start. Uh, we're told how much of each of these units requires in terms of raw materials and just a dollar amount. 
that each of these units requires five hours of direct labor hours at $35 per hour and the variable overhead is $55 per unit. We're told about the fixed overhead, 38,000 per month, include some depreciation. Why would that be important? It's only important if we had a cash budget, but we don't have that anymore. So it's just relevant if we're just interested in the cash overhead. Overhead, uh, overhead allocation rate in this example is direct labor hours. So as you can see, we only have two overhead rates and we always tell you what that um, allocation, that activity driver is gonna be. So you can read in your tutorial questions, is it the direct labor hours or is it the machine hours? Then we're told some, there's some sales commissions, selling and admin costs. We're gonna use that in our selling and admin budget. We're told that the ending monthly balance of raw materials, starting from this point is gonna be $100 each period. Working process is gonna be zero. So everything they start at the beginning of the period, they finish. There's nothing partially complete in their factory. And they've given some balance sheet information. So the uh, 1 January becomes the first quarter for 2010. So we're going to start uh, our operating budgets and we're going to also keep in mind about this quarter column. And so there's three months that make up a quarter. That's because it's a quarter of 12 months, 12 months being the whole year. So if you divide it up into quarters of 12, it's three months each. So this uh, budget is January, February and March. So we're gonna use some information from April to help us calculate March. And also this is about, uh, so most of the lines in our budgets, we can add across to get the quarter uh, column amount, but except for two particular uh, lines. One of them is the beginning, so beginning inventory, that has to be equal to the first month because you treat the quarter as a whole block of time. So the beginning inventories, that will be equal to January's inventories and the ending is the last month because it's what we want on the very last day of the quarter at 31st of March. So it's equal to the March ending is equal to the quarter ending. So we're gonna prepare the sales budget first. So why is this? So the sales, that's because the sales budget figures feeds into the production budget and the sales and admin budget. So because what we produce as a, as a manufacturer is based on what we sell. So we need to include that sales figures to determine production and also the sales figures in the selling and admin budget determining things like sales commissions that are variable based on the amount of sales that are made per, in, in number of units. We then need to uh, take the figures from the production budget into direct materials, direct labor and overhead budgets because it helps us to determine how much of each of those costs we need to, uh, to spend to make those particular products. We can then do the finished goods budget, which is about costing a unit of finished goods. So our three costs need to be added in there, direct materials, direct labor and overhead. And then we can record uh, how many, what's the cost of the goods that are sold for the period into our cost of goods sold. So here's our sales budget, which we do first. So we're gonna put in the number of budgeted units we're going to sell for the period from the question. Then we multiply it by the selling price per unit, 1,100. And that gives us our budgeted sales revenue. If we're going to do a budgeted income statement, that's where we take those budgeted sales figures next. But we don't do that in 1B. So we're just gonna now take those sales in units and take them down to our production budget. So our production budget, uh, it is possible for the sales budget to equal production budget if we do not have any uh, beginning or ending inventories. And that's possible that not that might exist but in our example uh, here and also in the tutorial questions, these companies like to have some sort of buffer. 
So they start with some inventory at the beginning and also they want to have enough um, ending inventories to cover next period's sales. So it's a very extreme example of how much they want to have on hand. Maybe they've had an interruption in the supply chain and having a month extra inventories on hand means they continue to sell in the next period in, uh, uh, and keep going for another month. Uh, even if the supply chain is interrupted, they can't get their supplies, they can't get their raw materials. And companies are very concerned about having the factory shut down because sometimes it can take a long time to get back up and running. So for example, steel mills, manufacture steel, they have glass furnaces for melting the iron ore. And if you shut down a blast furnace, it can take you know, two or three weeks to get it back up and running. So companies are very sensitive to interruptions in supply chain, which makes them want to have things like some beginning raw materials on hand or some ending inventory available so they can continue to sell to their customers. Because if you stop being able to sell to your customers, then they might, they may, your customers might switch to competitors. So that's why it's quite important. So here we've got our production budget. This first line comes from the sales budget. Then we're gonna put in our desired ending inventory. So in this case, it's equal to the next month's sales. So 140 in February, desired ending inventory 140 in January. So 150 from March becomes desired ending inventory in February and 110 comes from April. So it's it's very extreme example I'll say that and it's probably it's a non-perishable good and they have this ability to produce it all one month in advance and then they can keep selling for an additional month if the factory gets shut down. So that gives us a number of units needed then we're going to less any uh, beginning inventory because that beginning inventory is on hand. So the question told us they started with 75 units in finished goods. So maybe they didn't have this policy last year because we know it's not equal to January sales. So they've just started a new policy. So we pop in the 75 of ending inventories and then here it is, it's the, so, sorry, of beginning inventory. It's that's the beginning inventory for the whole quarter and our desired ending 110 in March is our ending for the whole quarter. So then this gives us our number of units to produce. And also you can see that the ending of January becomes the beginning in February and the ending in February becomes the beginning in March. So because let's say on the 31st of January, we close the factory and we say that's the close of the factory doors, then open them on the 1st of February and we have that 140 sitting there. So the, the ending of one period becomes the beginning of the next period. So we can now take these production figures down the bottom to our direct materials, direct labor and overhead budgets. So here are direct materials. We take that first line from the production budget. We're gonna multiply it by the number of, uh, the amount of our direct materials. And it's given to us in the question in dollar terms of $368. It's not given to us in unit terms of, let's say liters or meters or kilograms. In your tutorial questions, you will have this in terms of a particular unit measure. So you can do your uh, direct materials budget uh, in, in meters or liters or kilograms and then convert into dollars at the end. But in this question, we don't have a choice. And this is to introduce you to the fact that management accounting, we don't have any rules. So it's up to you. How do you want to do your direct materials budget? Do you want to start and do it with um, meters, liters, kilograms, or do you want to start off like this and have it in dollar terms at the start? And it would be in a real company uh, manager letting you know as the management accountant, what do they prefer? They might prefer to be in kilograms and then at the very end convert into the dollar amount. So then, so multiply those two together, it gives you production needs. Um, 
then you're going to add the desired ending inventory. So this company has decided from this year forward, they want to have $100 of ending inventory raw material in the storeroom. So then it's, it's ready, it's in the cupboard waiting for them to use it. And they don't have to worry if their supplier gets disrupted, they can switch to a new supplier. They have still got $100 worth of raw materials that are available. Then less the beginning. So we're going to put in that they started off with zero because they just started this policy now. Then the ending of January becomes the beginning of February 100. February ending 100 becomes the beginning in March 100. This then gives us our direct materials to be purchased. And that's the direct materials budget finished. We can then do the direct labor budget. So we take the production budget figures from, from, our, from earlier calculations, multiply by the direct labor hours per unit, five hours, then multiply by the wage per hour, $35. This gives us our total direct labor costs. We're gonna use that uh, direct labor amount uh, later on in our finished goods uh, calculation, because remember we're going to use direct labor hours as our activity driver. So here's our direct labor budget. We don't have any beginning or ending uh, of our direct labor hour because our employees just come and work and then they go home. So we can't store any labor up. So overhead budget. Once again, we take that first line from the production budget. Then we're going to multiply by our variable overhead rate, $55. Then add in our fixed overhead. So it's every month, 38,000. So this gives us our total overhead for the period. And we're going to use that 114,000 in our finished goods budget to help us to calculate our overhead of our fixed overhead, how much is applied. So we're going to take that fixed overhead for the quarter total, 114,000. So we can do now the selling and admin expense budget. And I could have done this budget straight after the sales budget if I want, because it uses the sales figures, because things like the sales commission is based on number of units sold. So I didn't need that production information. So here, the first line comes from the sales budget, number of units to sell, multiply that by the variable selling and admin expenses. And this gives us then, you know, so there's a sales commission of 2%. So 2% times the selling price, 1,100 of each product. So $22 every time a product is sold. So multiply $22. Then we've got our fixed selling and admin, which was told to us in the, in the question of 2,500 each period. So there's our selling and admin budget completed and this budgeted selling and admin would appear on the income statement. So it doesn't get included in cost of goods sold. So our ending inventory budget, the idea of this is to work out what is the cost of one unit of ending inventory. So the cost of our, our product is equal to our direct materials plus direct labor plus overhead. So here we put in direct materials, 368 per unit. That's just what they told us in the question. Add the direct labor, which is calculated as five hours per unit, multiplied by $35 per unit of that, sorry, of the hours of the, the direct labor rate. Then we put in our variable overhead, $55 per unit. Now, how do we calculate our fixed overhead per unit? It's based on our predetermined overhead rate of 114,000 from our overhead budget divided by 2,200 from our direct materials um, budget because the activity driver here is direct labor hours. And that gives us $51.82 per unit. But we, it takes five hours to uh, make each unit, so we need to convert that into the per unit basis. And that gives us $259 per unit of our fixed overhead. 
So each of our finished ending inventory is equal to $857. And we're going to use this to determine our ending inventory. So here we've got ending inventory, we've got raw materials, and the question just told us, okay, so raw materials, you should just have $100 left on hand. So we don't know how much units, no liters, meters, kilograms or whatever. So we just put in here, okay, $100 worth of raw materials, working process at zero because the question tells us zero working process. So everything that they start, they complete, they finish all of their goods and they're all manufactured during that period. Finished goods, we're told that, uh, and so from our production budget, because they wanted to have that desired ending left at the end of the period, it was 110 from the production budget. We now need to cost those inventories by multiplying by the amount of um, cost that we just calculated previously. We just calculated that 857. That's what that whole calculation was about so that we can then cost these finished goods inventory. So that comes to 94,270, add in the raw materials and so on. Our, um, if we had a budgeted balance sheet, we would put uh, a, one line for inventories of 94,370. So here is our cost of goods sold budget. So we can have uh, zero raw materials at the beginning. That's what the question told us. Add the raw materials that were purchased during the period. And so from our direct materials budget, gives us materials available. Add, oh sorry, less, less the, the closing raw materials they left at the end. Then this gives us direct materials used. We can then put in our direct labor use from our direct labor budget. We can put in the overhead from our overhead budget, adding together the variable and fixed overhead. This then add direct materials plus direct labor plus overhead gives our budgeted manufacturing costs. Add opening work in process. This is zero. So then we can then put in, that's our total cost of work in process minus zero ending work in process. Everything that started is finished. So no ending work in process. This gives us then our cost of finished goods manufactured. Add in from the balance sheet, we had some uh, finished goods that, that we started off the period with and there was no raw materials starting off. So we know that's all inventories. Then that gives us cost, uh, sorry, that gives us goods available for sale when we add those two together. We minus what's left at the end. So ending finished goods, what we calculated previously in our finished goods budget. Then this gives us our budgeted cost of goods sold. And that would then be uh, included in a budgeted income statement if we were to go along and calculate that. But we leave it at that point. That's our budgeted cost of goods sold. So now I'm going to touch on this in this part of the lecture, uh, some behavioral aspects of budgeting. So it's important that we understand as accountants, how are we affecting employees if we give them bonuses based on budgeted numbers or accounting numbers. And often accounting numbers are the basis of things like bonuses or incentive compensation. So here we've got Dilbert once again. Today I'll keep a positive attitude about life. And his boss comes along and says, I cancelled your project so I can use the budget to remodel my office. And he goes, yay, life. So you can have your budget taken away as well. And that's not so great. So how do we affect employees? Let's look at this. So we're interested in, you know, what's the behaviour of employees when we do reward them based on things like the budget. We have to be aware of perhaps in unintended consequences and what we call dysfunctional behavior. So if we do observe dysfunctional behavior, we can identify it, we can correct for it. And accountants are often part of the team in, that designs uh, performance compensation. So we need to be aware of this. What does it do if we make bonuses 
based on a budget or based on accounting numbers like net profit. So ideally what we want is goal congruence. We want the employees, managers to work in the interests of the whole company, not in their own personal interests or maybe have a skewed um, incentive. We want to clearly uh, set out the responsibilities and accountability of everyone. And we want to reward employees based on something they control. Uh, if they control over, they have control over something, then they're able to improve it. It becomes very um, demotivating if we give them a reward based on something they can't control, because this basically becomes luck as to whether that aspect that we're rewarding them on actually occurs. So think about a factory line worker, for example, in my car manufacturer behind me, what if we decided to give one of those employees a bonus based on the share price? Well, that's not very good because the, the manufacturing employees and the, and the production line can't control the share price of the company. So it's uncontrollable for them. It would demotivate them. So it's better if we give those factory line em employees a bonus based on maybe the number of cars they produce or uh, how efficient they are at, um, at that kind of production, something they can control. Someone like the CEO of a company, uh, let's say of, of Mercedes-Benz, the CEO of Mercedes-Benz, we could reward that CEO based on share price because they have much more of an influence on the value of the whole company. But we don't want to uh, reward employees based on something they can't control. They get, de they get demotivated about that. We also had to have some flexibility built in. So it's not good to have all or nothing targets. Like let's say the target's 1 million because you de-incentivize the employees if they're not going to reach that target. So you can have some sort of intermediary targets that they can get to help them to feel like they're being rewarded. So, and they won't, they won't just give up and go, oh, I can never do a million units. I'm not gonna even bother. So in terms of our budget preparation, we want to keep some things in mind when we're doing that budgeting process. We want it to be participative. So we want the employees to participate in uh, determining the budget figures. And so then they feel ownership over the budget. So one time I was, finished, I was visiting a manufacturer. I asked one employee, where's your budget? I was really excited. I was like, I'm gonna teach a lecture about budgeting. And they said, oh, it's in the bottom drawer. And they said, oh, I don't really look at that. I asked them why. And it was because they weren't included in the budget setting process. So it's really important you include your employees in that process. But there's a flip side. There's a potential downside if you allow uh, an employee to have full control over their budgeted uh, targets. The danger is that with, if they're not, uh, those, those budgets aren't checked or you know, benchmarked on a similar level of employee, that the employee might set it to be very achievable, or in fact, might build in some slack, such that it is very easy to achieve their budgeted target and then achieve their bonus. So that's sort of the flip side. Yes, you want employees to participate, but no, you don't want them to have, you know, absolute control over that budgeted number you need there to be some checks and balances to see if that number is reasonable that they put in. So now I'm going to introduce you to three types of dysfunctional behavior that we might see in employees because we're rewarding them on some sort of basis that's giving them a skewed incentive. Identifying a dysfunctional behavior is very important to help us to correct for that behavior. So we need to analyze the situation, work out what's going wrong, and so then we can try and fix it. So you'll see this in one of your tutorial questions for next week, that there's particular behavior that we're, that we're seeing with an employee. And once we've identified it, we can develop a solution to fix it. So I'll take you through three types of dysfunctional behavior that we can observe 
by giving employees a bonus and it could be it's unintended. We never intended for them to behave in a certain way. It just happens that they do. So myopia, that's one, but it's managerial myopia. If you put myopia into Google, it comes back with the short-sighted eye condition. What we're talking about here is managerial myopia. So when an employee is, is um, focused on a short-term goal over a long-term goal, and this can happen with listed companies, so listed on a stock exchange. So it might be that they just get caught up, they've got bonuses, or maybe they want the shareholders to get an immediate return, which means that they're foregoing maybe positive net present value projects or you know, investments that don't give a return until future years. So it could be that individual manager employee may favor short-term over long-term goals. And so they're making those decisions to take a short-term return project, maybe over a long-term return project. So maybe it's there's some bonus or target short-term that's causing this behavior to have only a short-term focus. So if you're seeing this happen, you can try and correct for it, maybe have some more longer-term bonuses or reevaluate why is that short term bonus being used. So, another dysfunctional behavior that can happen is something called slack creation, where let's say a manager or an employee builds into the budget uh, some sort of buffer so that they know they're easily able to meet their targets. So, they could do this through underestimating revenue. So then when the actual revenue is reported, it looks really good, it's much higher, or maybe they underestimate expenses. So that, oh sorry, overestimate expenses so that when the actual expenses come in, then they go, oh, like I did a great job controlling those expenses, but the expenses were actually lower than they, than, you know, what, what is reality kind of thing. So they, they've, They've built in this, this slack to enable them to show a good performance and potentially receive a bonus. So the manager might get the, the bonus or positive performance appraisal, but based on these budgeted numbers, however, it's because they created slack, they were then able to easily uh, meet, those, meet those targets. So you can see if they have this ability to have free reign over the budget and set low easy budget targets and then they're easily able to meet them get bonuses and rewards but in actual fact we wanted that employee to work harder to try and meet um, the actual real targets so this is a danger of having that employee participation if we don't have checks and balances they might create for themselves really easy targets i know of one employee at a company who was had full control over their targets and then they set a really easy target and they met that on the first day of the month and then the rest of the month they just watched Netflix. So you want to have those checks and balances. Is that, is that level appropriate? Uh, get the boss to check it, peer comparison with maybe a manager from another level, something like that. So the third type of bad behavior that we look at in 1B is really, it's, it's basically a lack of goal congruence. So it's when there's this misalignment between the goals of the company and the goals of an employee, of a division, it could be a store manager. So this lack of goal congruence, maybe there's some sort of business system or there's some bonus that's creating the incentive for that division manager or store manager to not act in the interest of the whole company. So it could be business segment or franchise manager. In order to get their bonus, they're willing to act in a way that's inconsistent for, the, for that whole company. So that's the way about thinking about it. There's the company, division, store manager. So for example, maybe, um, Let's, let's think about if this is McDonald's. So the McDonald's company might give a bonus to the store managers who reduce expenses. 
So then the store manager here might be thinking, she might think, oh, okay, in order to reduce expenses and achieve my bonus, I'll stop getting the employees to uh, refill the oil to fry the chips so that it's instead of every, the end of each week, it's the end of each fortnight that the oil is replaced. So then she's able to meet her bonus. However, this is against the incentives of McDonald's as a whole corporation because McDonald's wants the employee that wants the customers to get tasty food. And so the more often the oil is replaced, the tastier that the chips will taste. So they, they want the, the store manager to replace the oil more regularly. So you can see you can go out of alignment when we can put this sort of bonus in, we could try and correct it maybe, uh, give that store manager a reward based on customer satisfaction or you know, like modify the way that we're, we're managing because we want the goals to be aligned between the company, division, store manager and that kind of thing. So a little bit, we're going to touch on some variance analysis. So introducing you to how we're able to compare actual with budget. So once a period has finished, we can then evaluate the actual performance based on what we expected in the budget. And then we can um, manage that and do management by exception, investigate which particular variances might be favorable or unfavorable and need further checking. So is in the budget or not in the budget? Okay, so here's some variance analysis. You don't need to calculate this for the final exam. It's just important that, that you understand the concept that at the end of the period, we can check and compare actual with budget. Then we can get some variances. Maybe these variances are favorable or unfavorable. And then a manager can just investigate those aspects where there is a variance. So for example, if I was a man manager, I might uh, investigate this unfavorable variance of 303.3 uh, direct materials cost. And what I might do is then talk, if I'm the manager, I go and talk to maybe the purchasing manager in the company. I might ask them, well, why did you buy maybe more expensive raw materials? And then the purchasing manager might be able to explain, well, uh, it's very hard to find materials or maybe as a manager, I can encourage the purchasing manager to negotiate stronger, get a better deal for the future. So you can see managing just a particular number based on that variance that's being shown. So here's a flexible budget. So we can flex out our budget to different unit levels. And it's kind of a what if analysis. What if this uh, company produces 2,400 or 3,000 or 3,600, it makes it easier to compare than budget with actual. So then we can have them on the same unit level because sometimes uh, the actual that they would produce more or less units than we expect. So then we could um, compare our actual with budget and get our variances. And we can, we can also then, we could break our variances further down into variances that are due to volume. So producing a different volume and we can break it down into variances that relate to price. So maybe buying raw materials at a higher price compared to what we expected. And that's the end of the lecture. I'll see you next week. If you have any questions, you can ask me Otherwise, see you next week for the future of accounting. Bye. Have a good night. Bye. Bye, everyone. See you next week. Future of accounting. See you next week.